I'm Amy, sex educator, somatic sex and relationship coach, and sex shop owner. And I'm April, VP of an international high-end pleasure products company and boss queen sex toy mogul. We're best friends who make our own rules about who we are as sexual beings. With everything from how to be a badass in the bedroom to top tips for bringing your relationship to the next level, we have something just for you. So sit back, relax, and and enjoy enjoy the the show. Don't forget to head on over to our website at shamelesssex.com for more. And for 15% off of some of our favorite sex toys, use coupon code SHAMELESSPP in all caps at purepleasureshop.com. Well, hello, everyone. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Take three. Take three. Yeah, this is our third intro. Yeah. Um, only because April used someone's name on the last I one. Know. And we don't use names. Anyways, so I- we were saying that, <laughs> that we were just featured in Cosmo and Men, Men's Health Magazine. Shout out to Emily we from Sex with Emily. definitely need to give Emily Morris a shout out, though. Dr. Emily Morris, if you don't listen to Sex with Emily, you not you got to check out just one or two episodes. She, yeah, she is she has our hundreds. inspiration. Mm-hmm. She is our inspiration. And... She's a bite-sized piece of amazing. Yeah, she is. She's tiny. And she's part of the reason why we are where we are, because we went on her show and got inspired to do our own show. And I think she's part of the reason why we were recommended as the, one of the number one episodes to listen to in podcast world for in men's health. Was it just podcast or sex podcast? It's sex podcast. I think it's sex yeah, podcast. It was podcast. something to improve your uh, bedroom, bedroom style. Ooh. So that was kind of exciting. Well, hopefully this episode will help you to improve or at least be inspired. Um, in terms of improving maybe in person, we are teaching in person uh, in a couple weeks. We're teaching at Blue Boutique in Salt Lake City. This is on March 15th. We love Salt Lake City by the way I bought a cool lion head backpack there once which you should definitely bring with you because I don't think you've worn it once I since just, you bought it I just gave it away ah oh, damn it do you know why why moving nightmares movie the nightmares moving remember oh. I, I was like yeah you had too displaced many things. for a little bit so I had too many things and I, I couldn't I, I just had, had to let yeah, it go and someone moved. loved it someone's kid loved it and I was like the kid can have it because I am a, like a large child an old child. Well, and you—I remember you first got it, and then your whole tagline was just lying just around. Just lying around. <laughs> yeah, so you got rid of that. Um, but yeah, we bought—we bought that together. You were with me at Blue Boutique in Salt Lake City. We did, and I was like, "Are you going to EDC Festival?" And I'm like, "Perhaps." <laughs> yeah. I never know. Had you gone to? Oh yeah, maybe. Well, I'm so excited to be teaching there because we love Blue Boutique. They're one of like the first customers, and I don't mean to get all you know, uh, kind of retailer. Me, hot octopus retailer uh, oriented, but they were one of my first customers, and I didn't know that Utah was so open and so cool. And they really but like are undercover because undercover. they have all these laws, and there's a lot of Mormons yeah. there. So. <laughs> but I did so much awesome like business with when I worked with Fun Factory with this particular company, and then now moving into Hot Octopus, and then with Shameless Sex, they're like, "We love your podcast. We want to support you. People from Salt Lake City want to, you know." meet you guys and so so we're teaching a workshop yeah we're teaching our erotic superstar workshop which is a erotic empowerment workshop that is for all bodies no matter how you identify or whatever whatever bits you were born with um this applies to you i think it's on a friday night so they're giving you a 20 dollar gift card just for signing up by the way so it's essentially free because the class i think is 25 bucks 25 dollars then you get a 20 dollar gift card so you essentially get to come to the class for five dollars to hang out with us yeah so go to blueboutique.com <laughs> and sign up. It's uh, St. Patrick's Day weekend. So if you like that, you can just... We can go drink an Irish car bomb after. And throw up after in a bush. I can drink one and then yeah. I think I'll die. <laughs> 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 I was like rethinking this. We're also teaching in Santa Cruz, March 26th. If you live in Santa Cruz, uh, we're teaching at Pure Pleasure Shop. It's the same workshop. Erotic Superstar, so Erotic Empowerment. Uh, go to purepleasureshop.com if you want to come We've and join us. We've done one of those before, and we did one of those at Symbiosis. Yeah. However, we have perfected it. Yes. And if you have attended before, you know, you could attend again. There's probably some new information. If you haven't attended but wanted to... Come and join us. We'll It'll get be to fun. hang out with us too. That's yeah, fun. we'll have, we, and usually we pop a little bubbly or some sparkling water if you don't like bubbly. Or like eight bottles of wine. Maybe. Maybe. Eight bottles of margins wine. Eight bottles of Definitely margins. Definitely. Ma- Megan wine. has a whole new release coming out too. I it, know. This episode's going to air what in March? Like in 2019, a couple days. In a couple days. Yeah. <laughs> she it is has, March now. I know. Margins Wine.com. She's going to release 
a brand new, we don't even know what it's going to be yet, but a new, I believe it's a red, um, a new wine soon. It's a spring release. If you're not on the mailing list, get on the mailing list. That's the only way you get exclusive because she sells out so quickly. Marginswine.com. Sign up for the newsletter mailing list and you will get exclusive opportunity to be a receiver of the next shipment and we all know we're practicing on being good receivers oh, yeah, sometimes yeah. it's really hard to receive except for wine it's very easy for me to receive your voice wine. sounds so sultry i know it must be the wine it's the wine yes we have been drinking some margins wine just like a little bit just like a glass but with that said i have a testimonial to read to all of you this testimonial from a listener we just actually got nine hours ago we both loved it we both it saw that and we're it like brought we so much this. joy yes so and thank you for this so reading we're going to keep the listener anonymous but the Call us A and A, which I think is adorable because we are the A team. That's triple A. Trip no, it's two A's. A but and A and A. Oh my gosh, it is blowing your mind on a regular. So from this listener, they say, I'm just writing to thank you for the work that you're doing to make shamelessness the new normal. I've started listening to the podcast up to episode 15. By the way, I love when people binge and they start from the episode one and then they send that. And I'm like, if uh, if you're still listening, our sound has gotten better. I swear, <laughs> our sound and our flow. Yeah, we don't interrupt each other. We had a lot what? of feedback. What? Do you mean? What? Oh damn what? it! <laughs> Where we we? What? I mean, I work really hard not to interrupt you. It's also helpful my grammar sure. though hasn't improved. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyways, I've just started the podcast episode fifteen. Up to episode fifteen, and already you've helped me work past the false assumption that I've always carried, equating arousal and pleasure with erections. Releasing that ball of shame I have been feeling when I was wasn't able to harden on demand has been very liberating. Like taking my sex life to the chiropractor. Ooh, we're chiropractors. My girlfriend now listens with me as we drive to work, and we refer to this as putting on the sexy ladies. And your techniques for empowering speaking, empowered speaking have become the agreed-upon rules of engagement when we have a disagreement. This has all happened in the space of, where, of about two months, and my head is spinning from how much life has changed. Even my taste in music has narrowed as I listen to song lyrics I enjoy in the past and think, wow, there's a lot of shame in this. Whoa, look at us. Uh, thank you for everything, and I'll catch up with you soon in episode 90-something, which is now. Um, I have to say, I do listen to a lot of hip-hop, which shame tends to not have a lot of empowerment, but I, my, my favorite is make when a good dance. Yes, you know that one. Yeah. Strippers. All these chicks, cheeks popping pussy. What? Wait, all these, wait. Cheeks popping pussy. But I'm, I'm just dropping bands. bands. <laughs> or popping poppin bands, yeah. This is her stripper song. Um, yes, not the most empowering, but um, I love hearing when uh, listeners are using the empowered speaking part, when it's they're, they're now like checking in with each other, like, oh, okay, maybe we should implement the tools that we've heard and slow down and start speaking in a loving way. I love hearing that. That makes And also well, the great thing about reference and all that. P.S. to this listener, thank you for your testimonial. I consistently have to check myself as well to be an empowered listener, an empowered speaker. It's not something that, I don't know, just happens naturally for me. So I work on it all the time. And uh, I, I don't know. I think it's, it's really, for me helpful to hear the feedback that you're listening and you're taking the advice thank, thank you, you listener we love you we love re receiving testimonials if you have not reviewed us on itunes go to itunes and review us give Someone, us the five stars we, we like the five and if you hate it's us great. then we get it go ahead and do what you need to do but <laughs> there's amy's therapeutic way coming out. I'm like, give us the five stars. Well, I mean, and I he's like, that. if you want to just give us whatever you feel is right. Someone recently asked, like, I, I hear what you're saying about reviewing on iTunes, but how do I do it on Google Play and Spotify? And I honestly don't know. I don't think you can. I don't either. It, it's funny because iTunes has their own algorithm for everything, like the way they monitor everything and also the way they actually upload reviews. They don't take every review, apparently. Yeah. So yeah. um, if it seems uh, to be something that's deemed on a, inauthentic, which yeah. is cool. So like be it, authentic, everyone. It has to be authentic. Force your authentic. I don't know <laughs> about Google Play or... I don't know. I, I think Spotify doesn't have reviews at all. Um, and then I know th the other platforms that we're on, I don't know about the reviews. You can review us on our website. Can they? Yeah. Where? I think that you can uh, go to each episode and look at it. It doesn't matter. I'll check it out. We'll okay. come back to you on that. All right, anyways, so, yeah, go and review us. We'd love that. Oh, no, you can like it on the uh, website. You can like it. I don't know if you can actually make a comment. I actually reviews. think you can make a comment. But also on the, on the blog. 
No, on, oh, on the episodes. On our episodes. Yes, yes, yes. So, but I think the more effective way, because it's mainstream, is iTunes. If people want to make an impact on other folks' lives, for them to be able to find us. Okay. Well, that's awesome. And I hope that you all are still with us and want to review us. And this episode uh, is on, which we're going to read the bio in a little bit, but we have a couple things. We're going to answer the sex question. We have a couple other things to talk about, but is uh, specifically on chronic illness, chronic pain, sex, and relationships, which if you don't feel like you uh, identify with chronic illness right now, don't tune out because uh, chronic pain is, and, th- and just disability in general, but chronic pain is something that, what do you say, like half of 40%, Americans? 40% crazy of the population. Crazy numbers are dealing well, I with. I didn't realize that it's not only uh, dealing with it, it's someone that you know, yeah. a friend, a family, like my family member, my sister, has had chronic pain. She's b- had rheumatoid arthritis mm-hmm. for, but, yeah. th- I don't know, 40 years almost. Yeah. And uh, she has lupus and a-, a bunch of different autoimmune things. And I am really excited to share this episode with her. Um, and, you know, she's not super s- savvy on listening to podcasts, but I'm trying to, you know, get her to do that. Shout out to sister. So, yes, tune in, stay here, listen. This is And this applies to... Even even beyond, like we said in the, you'll hear in the intro that it's if you, even if it's just chronic illness, chronic pain, but like erectile issues, you know, or um, a dry vagina and things like that that is related oh, yeah. to illness like diabetes. And there's all these different things that contribute to a shift in um, the changes in our body or the pain that we feel. And that's always there when we show up with our partners. But so knowledge is power. Cause Why not yeah. learn more? Yeah. You might know someone or know someone that knows someone. So tune in. It's good. Yep. It's great. So before we do that, let's do a sex question. Uh, this is the sex question. When I read it to April, we got very excited about answering the sex question because <laughs> it also speaks to that <laughs> online campaign that we just did. That is about uh, a lot of which we got shadow banned on Instagram for like five seconds, but now we're back. I mean, it was a few days. It was you were panicked. I was freaked out. I was like, everybody, calm down. It's a bug. It's a bug. I was scared, but we were, we're back, and there was a lot of folks who posted. Things and if you don't know what we're talking about, we won't go into detail. Amazing but go things. to yeah. our our Instagram at Shameless Sex Podcast, and then you'll know. Um, but a lot of women were saying that um, they have either cheated, had affairs, or have a uh, desire for someone other than their married person. They're specific, usually, I think, specifically straight women talking about their husbands. Um, and we're not advocating for cheating or any of that, but we're just highlighting the actual experiences of what's really happening. So just so you know, before you hate on us for that and our and our um, our listeners and the people that are sharing this, that uh, we're all for integrity and this is what's happening. So from this person who's also anonymous, they say, um, I have only been with one man, my husband, sexually for the past 20 years until recently. I fell for a co- coworker a couple of years ago, and I've been having an affair while mentally beating myself up for it the whole time, yet enjoying it for the pure joy and sexual pleasure of it. The sex is super intense and more adventurous than I've ever had. He really understands and appeals to my core erotic theme. Obviously, they've been listening to our episodes, of which if you don't know what I'm talking about, go to episode two. Of being dominated and wanting to be violated. He is so confident and natural at painting sexual imagery that turns me on. His cock is much larger and thicker than my husband's, and he can go for two to four hours and ejaculate multiple times during. Basically, it's the best sex of my life. Being that I've only been with one other man, I am wondering if I have found my perfect sex partner or if this is something many other men can offer. Could I experience this kind of sex with another man? Do you have any advice? Or can you shed any light on this for me? I don't have any friends I can talk to about this, being that it is a secret affair, and I'm pretty sure... I can never have this kind of sex with my husband, being that he is not as well endowed and lacks the confidence to be dominant. If I leave my husband, I am wondering if I can find this kind of sex elsewhere or have I discovered my perfect sex partner? Non-operative word, perfect. Oh, yeah, that one. Don't, yeah. So you have a couple of points about this. I mean, you, you had an affair. So I did have a lot of emotional activation from reading this because the excitement, the taboo nature, the kind of like the amount of energy that you put into an affair is, it has so many different levels of, of like that 
and I was trying to explain the word to you before when we before we started recording. Did you figure the word out? No, oh. but it, it it's like because Shitty. it's so yeah. naughty, yeah. it feels so good. It's yeah. it's this. I don't know. It's a typically shameful act. And anyway. It makes I, it extra exciting. It, de- it really does. And um, the perfect scenario of this, as you said, is that, no, no, to this listener, it, it, it's not your perfect partner. You're going to change and you're going to. There is no perfect. No. You're, it might seem like it's ideal. It mm-hmm. might be really exciting because some of your needs weren't being met prior to this person however um i can tell you that like i if it were if it were me in this position i would probably and i know you'll have some great words of wisdom from a sex educator standpoint but for me i've lived this and it was exciting and so new and it did break help me break free of a relationship that was serving me but not in the ways that i needed to be served like my needs weren't being met and his n- needs weren't being met. And I think that um, being out of integrity and being, s- I-, I think, not honest with the person that you that you are choosing as a partner uh, is, I-, I don't recommend that. I think it's a lot to live with. It's a lot to live with. And yeah. it's it's going to come up, it's, it's going to come down to, yes, this person is fulfilling the affair, a- affair, uh, have her or have he, the person that you're having the affair with is going to fulfill something. I think that um, it's a matter of you addressing what your where your needs aren't being met and revisiting those and maybe having a conversation slash getting out of the relationship of 20 something years. I know you might have children or you might not, or you might think that they love you and, and you love them and this is it, but it doesn't have to be the one. The one is such a fucking. Well, yeah. Perfect. They're asking specifically like perfect sex partner. And I will say like, yeah, there's no perfect partner. People seem really shiny when they're new and they're not the person we've been with for 20 years. And this is so common for people to have affairs and think, oh, my God, this is so exciting. This person's perfect. And then once they get to know the other person, they see all of their other shit. Because, like, they're not... When they're new and exciting, and they're just, like, the other person on the side, you don't see all their stuff. You don't see all of their... their I want to call them flaws, but, like, the parts that don't aren't compatible with Of you. the partner, which is what of I did. Well, of the person on the side. The person yeah. that's, that's not fulfilling them. I yeah. was like, oh, this person isn't strong enough. They're well, not no, no, no. together enough. I'm saying enough. you don't see the ones of the new shiny person because they're so shiny and new that you're blinded. Oh, yes, that they're, too. They're so shiny that you're like, oh, my God, perfect. But they're probably representing parts of the partner that you have currently yeah. that you're in a relationship with. Mm. They're probably fulfilling parts of those. Yeah. That and you're not and I, I can say that this person's saying, like, the, you know, the, the cock size and can... Um, last two to four hours and all those things. Like, yes, those are all shiny things. But I, what I will say is, one, uh, a lot of this stuff is going to be fleeting because when we stay with, like, when we, when we find great sex with someone, guarantee that it will change. Guarantee that you have these, you know, two to four sex sessions and their cock seems to be fit you perfectly and you have the best sex of your life. I would not, if you want to have a long-term relationship or, or a partnership, I would not base it on those things because they're guaranteed to change. The cock size isn't going to change, but that like passion and that those long sex sessions, if you're basing your relationship off of that, I can promise you in two to three years, maybe even one year, maybe even six months, things are going to change because that's what happens in long-term relationships, which also speaks to your marriage that... Of course, it's not feeling that great, amazing. And I'm wondering if the relationship maybe even started on not having a good sex life in general at that time. Uh, My question for this listener as well is, is the person that they're having an affair with aware of like the relationship and are they in a relationship there? I mean, there's a lot of also dynamics that could be involved in that, which may not matter, but they also could because if it's two like very igniting exciting things for both parties and that person that, that they're having like an affair the with. The other one's getting high too, so it's yeah. extra high. So because it's you're extra like, high. That's you're high on the, exactly. the taboo that we're not supposed to do this drugs. So it, it's 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 not real. It's like yeah. being on vacation and, and hooking up with someone. When you get into reality, yeah, and then on the things f- can kind of shift. The flip side, I will say that people are sometimes married and then do have an affair with someone that is kind of their soulmate. But this person's just talking about sex. They're not saying that, 
you know, we have all the same shared interests and we want to build a life together and uh, we have and whatever your your other morals are of things that you need for a relationship. This is just talking about sex and they're saying are there other amazing sex partners out there? Can I experience yes. this kind of uh, sex with another man? Yes and yes. 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 Guaranteed. There's 7.6 billion people in Rising. Yeah. Guaranteed. We ha- I have a girlfriend who I'm not going to say her name, um, but she just exited a year and a half ago a relationship where it was like the most mind-blowing sex ever, and she's very sexual person. Like She thinks about sex 20 times a day. I envy her sexual skills, or her, her libido. And she was so scared of leaving that relationship for her because she's now, you know, she's what, 41, 42, and felt like she found the best sex of her life, but the relationship wasn't working, so she had to leave. It was so scared that she wouldn't find it again. And the first guy that she started sleeping with again is even better sex. Like, she thought this other one was amazing and mind-blowing. This first guy that she's sleeping with was just, like, also even more mind-blowing than this other person. And so I just want to tell you that, you know, if you're just talking about sex, there, it, the world is your oyster. Anything is possible. There is no... time for them to leave the relationship. Yes. If you're just... If you really are... They're not asking... Like they're kind of asking, like, should, they're not really asking, should I leave my... Well, no. If I leave my husband. They're saying, is this just really special to this perfect sex partner? No. And no, it's not. You can um, find that in a lot of different folks. And should you leave your partner, which you're not necessarily asking, um, if you're... if I My advice would be like April said, to have a conversation first to see if you do desire to work on things with your partner to see if this is all this is possible in this relationship, then talk to them about it. Uh, if you don't desire that, though, then maybe you leave the relationship. Yeah, time to but go. don't leave the relationship just for shiny, hot sex that, because... You need more than because that. Because the shiny, hot sex person might be like, oh, wow, now you're so attainable. I'm actually going to peace out. Or the sex I is gotta guaranteed go. to change. Or like the, the shiny, sex won't be as good. Hot sex is never something But how many times consistent. do you know of where people leave relationships for something shiny and, and amazing? Backfire. And it backfires. Always backfires. Dude, <laughs> always. Like somehow it's like, oh, Shit. guess what? Oh, Here I no. am again. It looks so good. That was a good question, though. That really sparked a lot of uh, emotion within us both. And, but we're also not in any way judging or shaming this no person way. because um, like our online campaign highlighted... Uh, this is so common. It's so common, especially if you live in a place where the norm is to get married at a young age, you know, the first person that you had sex with or wait to have sex until marriage, and then 40 years or 20 years down the road, you're like oh, fuck, I'm still here and I know there's more out there and I made the wrong choice or my partner's not willing to work with me. So we we totally get it. And uh, I, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that... You are writing your own story mm-hmm. right now. You're making your own story. I remind myself that of, of, of that particular thing all the time. And I have to tell you, it's it's not easy. Like sometimes your story is blissful and each page that you cover is amazing. And I'm like, I am so thankful for this life. And sometimes I'm like, wow, how did I get here? Oh my God. Like I'm so scared Mm -hmm. or I, I don't understand why I, you know, I don't have, I don't have children or, um, I'm not as loved by my parents or I, my friends, uh, you know, are all in their own lives and, and they have their own stories. Like I don't feel supported or loved. And then I realize, like I am in, I'm in power to find my own happiness. My partner can't find it for me. You can't find it for me. I have to do that. And if good sex brings it to me time, you know, time and from time to time. Awesome. But, but don't rely on I'm not going to rely yeah. on that shit. Yeah, so. that is yeah, that is shifting and changing all the time. Uh, which brings me to the making your own rules to our workshop, our wild women sex workshop that we have on our website. If you go to shamelesssex.com, you can find our wild women workshop and it is all about how to learn how to make your own rules for your sex life. It is a four video online series that you can do anytime anywhere anytime you want to it has all kinds of sexy homework we have an erotic meditation on there we have access people don't to like homework though s- i would say it's it's practice it's a practice tools yeah tools, tools are a better uh, are a better way because people are like homework ew i'm like well it's tools like you can print it out and look at it but later need, yeah we, i mean we need the tools that's how we learn is we start exactly. practicing the things it's a referral mechanism yes. to but help you, you go to our website and you can learn uh this is for female identified folks learn how to make your own rules to have really fucking 
awesome sexual empowerment, sexual liberation, and in turn, probably a lot better sex with yourself and with other people because you'll be more in tune with what the fuck it is that you want. Are you ready for Dr. Lee? Yeah, but we forgot one thing. What did we forget? OMGS. We did not. We forgot. Oh, I'm, oh my, OMG. Oh, my, we forgot. Oh, OMG, OMG, yes. yes. OMG. We actually just had a conversation with uh, OMGS they folks the today. Awesome. They're and so I'm nice. going to say a really a superlative fuck because fuck, they are so cool. <laughs> <laughs> they are. Like, it's fuck. not even necessary. Amy hates when I say fucking no. in between. Well, fucking, it, and when yeah. I use it as a filler word. You have Fucking, they're so fucking you really, cool. You really got rid of that. I did. Yeah. I work on it. See? Once I told you, I you sometimes like, do some work, Amy. <laughs> um, we love, we love, 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 love OMGS, and this is the thing about us because we've worked with um, folks who are in the sex toy industry or in the sex education realm. We love folks that are good, kind-hearted humans with a like a mission. They're here to help change the world. It's not a monetary mission; it's a mission to help change. No, they want to help world. change the world exactly. for sure. Like and us, that's yeah. why we're doing what we're doing. And that's uh, in OMGS it's like, is like yeah. a completely research-based online program for people to learn about sexual pleasure season one is just about what can I think it's like. a good gift even for your mom because I gave it did to my mom and she's like er, no. but your mom oh, doesn't yeah. call you for like yeah I haven't year. talked to her in a while but she told me that she's <laughs> like okay I'm getting ready to do it <laughs> like, what are you gonna do I'm like you're gonna check it out you, so it's 62 videos and then there's even modules where you can actually practice the techniques it's tasteful videos with real human beings with real bodies that are showing you what their body's like in terms of pleasure so if you own a vulva and you're like I want to learn how to better orgasms or I don't have orgasms and I want to learn how to have orgasms or just pleasure or, or I want to learn about clitoral orgasms versus other kinds of orgasms or if you are a vulva admirer and you're like I I want to learn how to pleasure vulva. Or my left labia might look different than my right. Am I still going to be able to pleasure myself? Yes, you are. You can find some videos. Maybe you like swirls. Maybe you like tapping. Maybe you like Edging. a little bit of pushing, pressure up left quadrant. <laughs> Maybe to the right. Maybe I don't to know. The right. Maybe, the Maybe it's like you're a pirate of your own vulva. And you're like, yar. You're like, yar, where am I going to go, matey? <laughs> This is, they don't do any of this at home. No, I mean, don't. actually, they do some of that. They don't say yar, though. No. Um, but anyways, we recommend checking it out. Go to omgs.com backslash shameless. You all get $5 off. That makes it 34 bucks, and you get unlimited access to season one. That's 62 videos. It's not a subscription. Um, it's changed our lives. It's changed our is clients' it 34 lives. Bucks? I thought it was 49 and then it was... 39 minus $5 wow. is $34. All right. Get it, because they're probably raising the price. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> when season two comes out. Yeah. All right. All right. Are you ready for the bio? I'm so ready. Okay. <clears throat> Doctor. So this is uh, so this is all about chronic illness, chronic pain, sex, and relationships. Which is something that we've actually have a lot of, of listeners that are interested in. Many people have written us and now ask and you shall receive. And we again, listen to your feedback. Like we, like he's, the numbers that he says, this, this affects like 40% of the American population. And if it's not affecting you directly, indirectly, you someone, someone you know. Yeah is definitely affected by chronic pain and illness. So Dr. Melvin L., which is Lee, Dr. Melvin Lee Phillips Jr. is a licensed clinical social worker with a private practice in Washington, D.C., where he treats chronic illness and sexual dysfunction, and he's also author of the book Sex and Love When You Are Sick, due to release in late 2019. He is a speaker and has lectured on topics including preventative services, anxiety and stress management, caregiving stress, depression in the elderly, mindfulness and cognitive strategies for chronic pain, ethical decision making, and the assessment of mental disorders. Are you ready? I actually want to just give him a shout out because Dr. Melvin, you are fabulous. We love him. Yes. Yeah. All right, let's do it. Let's go. All right, everyone, it is episode time as promised, and we are super excited about this episode. Uh, if you all listened to an episode that we did when we were talking about uh, sex and disabilities, part of the reason why we did that episode, and we were very clear stating that uh, we were not professionals in this department, this was not our ex expert expert department, um, but that we part of we, we were doing that is to shed some light on something where we were actually looking for more speakers to talk about what it's like um, living with a disability of any sort, whether it is uh, cognitive or physical. 
um, disability or just a chronic illness as we're talking about chronic pain uh, and how that affects sex and relationships. And we found some speakers. And so this topic is specifically on uh, chronic illness, chronic pain and uh, sexuality and relationships. So we're super excited to have you here. It's Dr. Melvin Lee Phillips or just Dr. Lee, Dr. Lee Phillips. Melvin, we're, yes. Dr. Yeah. Lee. Dr. Lee. Me Dr. Lee. Yeah. I like that. Hey, Dr. Lee. <laughs> <laughs> so we're super happy to have you here. Uh, and, and I just also want to, I think we said this when we recorded that episode before on sex and disabilities, um, that someone doesn't really, I think, have to identify as having a disability for this to shed some light in their life, right? It's like, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about erectile dysfunction and um, various aspects of, of the way the body can change when we have um, a disability of some sort. And uh, so this, if you don't identify as someone who has a disability or you're not in a relationship with someone that has a disability, you might still get something important out of this. So um, let's start with just telling us how you got to where you are today. Why is this work around sexuality, relationships, and chronic illness important to you? And what inspired you to write your book, Sex and Love, when you were sick? Yeah, well, about five years ago, I was working in Williamsburg, Williamsburg, Virginia, where I'm from. And I was working as a geriatric psychotherapist. Um, I was working with people that were actually 65 and up. And one of the things that I wanted to do was start like a chronic pain management group because I was seeing a lot of that coming into my office. So I kind of got a curriculum together and I implemented that and started this group. But then I started to see my name kind of got out there. We started advertising for the group. And then I saw like younger people coming in to see me, like people that were like 18 and like up, like 18 to 40. And they were coming in with a lot of chronic pain due to like chronic illness. So I was seeing a lot of folks that had fibromyalgia, multiple sclerosis, different autoimmune diseases, neurological issues, and had a lot of anxiety and a lot of depression centered on their illness. And one of the things they were talking about was, I'm single, I'm having a hard time dating, I have a lot of like low desire and arousal, I've even had some sexual dysfunction due to my pain. And I was like, well, that's kind of interesting. So I ended up moving to DC September of 2017. And I went into private practice part time. It's kind of funny, I actually moved up to DC to become an administrator in behavioral health. That was like, my whole goal. I was like, my clinical days are done. I don't want to be a therapist anymore. I want to push paper. And then I hated it. I was so bored. <laughs> and I said, well, what can I do? So I started to go into private practice part time. And I liked it so much that I started doing it full time. And I signed a contract with a group private practice and I started my chronic pain management group again. And again, I kept seeing the same theme of sexual dysfunction and low desire. And so then I went to a workshop on how to build your private practice. And the woman who facilitates that workshop, she's one of the best sex therapists in the Washington DC area. And she said, have you ever thought about becoming a sex therapist? And I said, yeah, I have. And so I started the process and that's what did it. So I started to specialize in sex therapy and chronic illness. And now it's just really boomed. That's really all I see are folks that have sexual dysfunction issues with chronic pain, chronic illness. And then I started seeing a lot of couples and helping them reconnect sexually with each other. And by that point, I said, I need to write a book. I've got to do something. I've been working in this field for 12 years as a therapist. And I think when you've worked in the field that long and you have this experience, I think it's important to write about it and speak about it. So that's how the idea came along. And then I thought, well, maybe I should write this book for other therapists, but I really want to touch other people that have chronic illness, that have issues of sexuality. And so that's how the book came into being. And it's been great so far. So many people are interested in it already and it's not even done. And right before we started recording, but I thought it was so important, we we talked about and you kind of gave some interesting stats that there are really no other resources for folks with chronic illness, especially about sexuality. I think you said 1988 there was a book, which obviously is a bit out of date. Uh, so that's exciting. Um, 2008 or in 1988? It was like 1988, there was a book. And then there was the ultimate guide um, for disabilities with sex in 2007, which is a fantastic book. And it talks about different myths um, that people have with sexuality that 
you know, that have chronic illness. But what is interesting is that there's a lot of books out there on chronic pain and chronic illness, a lot of fantastic books, um, some from 2015 and 2016. And most of these books are written by people that have experienced chronic illness themselves, but um, not any books out there from a psychotherapist point of view. And then there's no, really no literature out there on chronic illness and sexuality. Why? Because we don't talk about sex. Yeah. And I mean, how, like, define chronic illness for our listeners and, and actually um, how common it, act, it is uh, for folks and kind of what it, are the experiences that these folks are having. And um, I mean, I can only imagine how it's affecting their lives, but maybe you can give our listeners some examples. Absolutely. Well, what's what's really interesting is that, you know, according to the Center of Disease Control and Prevention, chronic diseases affect about 133 million Americans, representing more than 40 percent of the population of this country. And by 2020, that number is projected to be estimated to 157 million. So Uh, that's almost half of our population, people So so that we probably have a lot of listeners experiencing chronic illness out there. Right. Or pain. Right. So what I specialize in is chronic pain caused by a chronic illness. So these are different autoimmune diseases, neurological diseases that people can have. They may have a surgery. So pre, uh, pre-pain before a surgery, post-pain. So not necessarily a chronic disease, but sometimes just chronic pain. One of the ones that I see more often is fibromyalgia. That's a big disease that I see a lot of, a lot of people come into my office. And what's so terrifying about that chronic illness is that when they can't figure out what you have, they slap you with the fibro diagnosis. And so people walk out of their doctor's offices going, but what does that mean? What does that mean for my sexuality? What does that mean for me? And I think one of the most disturbing things about a chronic illness is that it's full of uncertainty. You know, um, I don't know if you watched the Oscars, but Selma Blair, was on there and she was just diagnosed with multiple sclerosis back in October of 2017. And she walked the red carpet at the Vanity Fair party. And was I she just, the actress that was in uh, like with Reese Witherspoon and like, uh, what yes. was that movie? And Ryan, uh, the dark haired, she, yeah, she oh was, my God, I didn't know in, that. She was in Cruel Intentions. Yeah, Cruel Intentions. That's Yeah, what she was also in Legally Blonde. Yes. Yeah, wow. and so, they showed her on the red carpet and she had a custom made cane because with MS, multiple sclerosis, it affects your vision. It affects your movement, your mobility. And she's having a very difficult time walking now. And there was one part where she's walking and the paparazzi is taking her pictures and they're like, Hey, Selma this way, this way. And she just breaks down crying and her manager comes to her and dries her eyes. And then she looks at everyone and she kind of chuckles and she's like, yeah, I'm always fucking shit up. <laughs> and, she said, and so then she said, she said, you know, I just really wanted to be here tonight. And it was so hard to get here. And I just, I don't know, like I melted. I mean, I, I started for a therapist that treats this. I just started bawling. I just started crying. It was very moving. Um, so yeah, just having to, to deal with the uncertainty. And that's the mystery behind chronic illness. So the first two chapters of my book, are about the brain. Like what happens with you during chronic illness and what happens to the brain? Because a lot of people come into my office and they say, Dr. Phillips, you know, I left my, my neurologist, I left my rheumatologist and they didn't mention anything about what's gonna happen in the future and what's going on with my brain and, and how is this gonna affect me and my life, my marriage, my children. So that's kind of what it is in a nutshell. Diabetes, heart disease, even depression is a chronic illness now. So that's another big thing. And there's just no magic pill that you can take to, it's so, especially within the sexual realm that you can take to help with this. It's like a process that I, I'm, I'm happy that you're shedding light on, but you really need to do some work and uh, focus inward to I'm sure get through a lot of this, this stuff that's popping up with chronic pain. Right. And, the, and I imagine the, the part that you're writing about the, the brain too, there's, isn't just the things change because your body's change, but also the, um, the internal story that we get really used to of, you know, I, I am my illness, right? I'm sure that you're, this yes. is what you're dealing with people, right? That becomes um, a big part of their lives that in its, in itself can really affect, I mean, chronic illness and chronic pain. We're saying that so if someone who doesn't experience this, right? 
you're sitting there, you're having a conversation with someone. There isn't this little thing jabbing at you, whether it's physically or mentally saying you're in pain, you're in pain, you're in pain, or you have this thing. And I, and I think that, that for folks that I know that do have some sort of chronic pain or chronic illness, uh, they're saying that it, that's, it's, kind of always there in the background yeah it's it's, always there and it's always so it's a it's it's somehow affecting all interactions so i mentioned sex and relationships in it's it's showing up there even if it's just a little bit or if they're trying to ignore it and to be fully present in that moment there's this little thing that's jabbing them that must be so challenging Right. And so what really happens, you bring up a good point because it does become ingrained that they're their illness. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that I work with individuals and couples on that you are not your illness. Mm -hmm. It's a part of you. It's here. But let's look at what you can do. And when it comes to sex, it's looking at what's possible instead of what once was once achievable. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we have this idea that to have great sex, we have to have the best damn orgasm. Mm -hmm. And we need to we need that's to all have. <laughs> that's all there is to it, everyone. That's all there is to it, right? Orgasms. And, and, you know, we have to have penetrative sex. Well, penetrative sex is one form of sex, right? So we talk about what else can you do? And I have to piggyback on Emily because it's pleasure is the measure. It's what is pleasurable to you, right? And to your partner. And so that's what I talk about with my patients in therapy. And they look at me and they're like, oh my gosh, I can be sexual. I can be touched in this way and I can do different things. So that's really where a lot of the work comes in. But there has to be this acceptance piece, right? Because when people do come in with chronic illness, they want to reject their body. They hate their body. And so there's this denial factor that plays in the beginning of that. Well, and, and a lot of what we teach to say, you know, just be present for all the touch. But if you hate your body, how hard is it to just be present in your body for touching or being? If you're in an immense amount of pain all the time too, it might be like, I don't want to get in touch with my body or hurts. I can't even, I can't fathom how hard that must be for someone. Right. So that's going to be like in chapter three of the book where I talk about the intersection of chronic illness and sex, Mm -hmm. because that's really what happens. You reject your body. You, you know, you don't want to be present. You're mad. You're angry. There's all these different emotions that come with chronic illness. And so that's why therapy is such a process. And you really do have to have a temperament to be a therapist because you may have one client with chronic illness that comes in one week and they feel fabulous and they feel great and they're having a bunch of sex and they're doing things around their home. And then they come in the next week and it's like a completely different person. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't get out of bed. I can't, I can't have sex with my partner. My partner got upset because we couldn't have sex. You know, we also have to look at the healthy partner too and what's happening there. And there will be a chapter in the book about the healthy partner and talking a little bit about the caregiving stress syndrome that happens. You know, are you my partner? Are you my caregiver? And that needs to be talked about as well. Yeah. I, yeah, I think that's, so you're speaking to some what this, what chronic illness means for uh, for, for folks with sex lives and relationships, but I guess maybe can you highlight more like what are some of the things that shift there? How does it affect them um, for folks who either, whether you're the partner of someone who has a chronic illness or you're the one with a chronic illness, maybe you both have a chronic illness, maybe you're dating multiple yeah. people, and, yeah. but, but I mean, how does this affect them? Well, it affects them in so many different ways. Again, it's earth shattering. So there's a lot of this, these different emotions that come up in the beginning. I think when someone is first diagnosed with a chronic illness, there's this crisis phase. There's a rupture in the relationship. And I say rupture because that's what really happens um, with different types of emotions, different types of feelings. And you know, when you're feeling like that, you have low desire. What I have found as a sex therapist is that There are, usually in a partnership, there's one partner that has higher desire than the other. I've seen that a lot. And what happens when you're that partner with chronic illness and here you were the one that had high desire and all of a sudden you don't have that anymore and the roles have to shift in the partnership. You know, you may have been the partner that initiated sex all the time and now you don't do that. So now your other partner has this other role that they have to play in the partnership. And I think that's what it really does. And, I, and that, there's, that's going to be another chapter in the book is this rupture. Mm-hmm. So the book is designed like an arc. It talks about the problem and what happens. And then it goes into like a resolution, like what you can do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So then how can, um, in, in partnership, how can uh, we how can we work with that? Like what are some tools that you offer in partnerships and ways so that the sex 
life and the relationship isn't neglected and we don't go into just I'm your caregiver or the person that has the chronic illness doesn't feel like they're always in this kind of, a, I don't know, victims not, well, yeah, victim could be the role too, but that we don't go into these roles because I understand also with sex and relationships, no matter what, whether there's chronic illness or not, things change. And so we, we change with, with it and roles change. And so you're talking about, you know, embracing that and shifting with that, but that's its own challenge. But and what are some ways that we uh, work can work together in this? That's a really great point because you're right. No matter if you've got chronic illness or what, our relationship changes as time goes on. And so does sex, right? You know, with our bodies and when we age, we have to take all that into consideration. Well, there's two different types of needs that partner ha- partners tend to have. We have your emotional needs and we have your sexual and your erotic needs. Your emotional needs are trust, honesty, communication, and respect. When there's a rupture in one of those, we start to see a domino effect, then it hits everything else. And when a chronic illness comes, it becomes earth shattering, so it knocks everything down. What I've seen with couples is sometimes the couple needs to have banging ass sex, and then it will the relationship will fix itself. Or we see this rupture where they need to work on their emotional needs, and then they can have great sex. You know, so that's what I really work with. So. One of the things is communication, there's sexual empathy. So being empathetic with your partner, we talk about that in session, what does empathy mean? And then also sexual communication. I think we go into these partnerships and people think, you know, that they assume what their partner likes. Well, that's not always the case. So you need to talk about that. And I find that to be very helpful. So sexual empathy, sexual communication. And one thing that I do as a therapist is I always ask them, what was your sex like before the illness? Mm -hmm. Another big piece, you know, what was happening then? Were you having sex? What type of sex were you having? What does sex mean to you? So in the beginning stages of therapy, it's all about psychoeducation. And then once they can build a rapport with you, because I mean, think about it. These people are coming in feeling broken. They don't know if they can trust you. So when you build that therapeutic relationship, then you can really get into the work. So my biggest tip is really communicating about your needs and what you need from your partner. And that's what I find the most helpful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I imagine that there often is uh, a story that happens where someone feels like they're communicating being in pain and they start to feel like a complainer. And there's so many, it's very complex, I'm sure. It is complex. So one of the things that I use in therapy that's very helpful, it's a mirroring process where the couple turns into each other and once the sender and once the receiver. So the sender will send a message and then the partner will just mirror back exactly what they say. Mm. Because when you find, when couples are communicating and you guys probably know this too, you're already thinking about how you're going to react to your partner. Okay, you're coming at me with this. So what's going to be my reaction? Mm. So in the mirroring process, you can't do that. You have to mirror back exactly what they say. And then the partner will say, you know, they'll mirror it. The partner that's the receiver will say, did I get that? And the sender will say, yeah, you got it. Anything else? And then they'll start the mirroring process again. I find that's very helpful. Um, My mentor, Tammy Nelson, who's a sexologist, she got done, she just finished writing, um, when you're the one who cheats, 10 things you need to know. I think she's coming on our show at some point. Yeah. Oh, you, yeah, she's fabulous. And she wrote a book called Getting the Sex You Want, which talks about the mirroring dialogue. And she, she does a lot of that work and she's passed that on to me. So that's really helpful when you're working with a couple. We've talked a little bit about that before as well. That's helped me. The mirroring uh, kind of scenario has helped me in my relationship because I tend to get really heated and and I tend to like do the level one listening where I just am thinking about my response and my defensive reaction. So it's so helpful on um, in any relationship to do that sort of active listening instead of the active reacting. Um, And I love that advice. I think that's great. You're going to have a whole chapter on that, I hope, in your book. I am. I am for the couple, like how they can reconnect. So it's reclaiming the sex life that can work for them. A lot of it really does come down to sexual communication, sexual awareness, being aware of what you like sexually. So it's developing a new normal of your partnership when you are faced with a chronic illness, you know, and I find it very hard for couples that have been together for years, then all of a sudden, 
you're diagnosed with a chronic illness after being together for, I don't know, 10, 20 years. You know, Selma Blair was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis at the age of 46. Um, so, and I think sometimes we need to go into relationships. You know, every time we go into a relationship, we are taking a risk. So what's going to happen when you're older, you know, um, and you grow together and what can you do to work as a team instead of opponents? That's the big thing too. When this rupture happens with a chronic illness, there's always this power struggle that starts. And so the mirroring really does help with that as well. So that's a, that's a really great tip to actually, if you're in a partnership with someone that, um, you're, that has chronic illness, for instance, um, that's a great way to kind of support them. Like, we're going to do the mirroring thing, but do you have any other kind of suggestions of how someone in a, you know, a partnership with someone that has a chronic, chronic pain or chronic illness, what they could do and support as well? Well, you know what I really like to do is sensate focus with the couple. So if they have this low desire or they have a sexual dysfunction, whether it's erectile dysfunction, vaginal dryness, you know, diabetes causes vaginal dryness. So if there's any of those things going on, a different type of therapy that we use in sex therapy or a form of sex therapy is sensate focus, which is a series of touching that the couple can do. So where else in your body do you feel sensation? Is it behind your neck? Is it your ears? Is it your your chest? Where is that at? When I was taking my sexual attitude reassessment course for my ASEC sex therapist certification. We watched this video where a guy, he fell off of a building, he had no feelings from his hip down, he was paralyzed. And so he went to a tantra worker and she did this type of massage with him where she stroked his thumb like a penis. Mm -hmm. And it felt so good to him. Mm -hmm. You know, he was able to, to feel pleasure, to feel great. So a lot of it has to do with touch. Mm -hmm. So when a couple can get there after they have accepted the illness, after they have made a pact that they want to work on this together, I give them a lot of homework with a series of touching and then stopping, touching again. So with Sensate Focus, you're really not supposed to have sex the first two nights you do it. But hey, if the couple comes in and they're like, hey, Dr. Phillips, we had sex the second night, I'm like, well, great. That's the whole point. So it's just getting them into this way of, of touch. And, you know, if I'm working with a, if I'm working with a female and a male, you know, different ways to stimulate, um, the vulva, you know, the, the clitoris and different things, different toys that you can use too. We talk a lot about that. So that's very helpful. Is it, so would you say then, so we say we have two partners, you know, we're two people in the partnership. One has chronic illness, one doesn't. Um, is it helpful for them to, would you say, especially as being a supporting partner, to kind of make that commitment that this is not just your illness, this is now our illness? Is that a really helpful part of the support system in partnership? Yes, it's very helpful. And I like that you said that because it does become both of the partners with the illness. They're forming a relationship with it. And what can they do to work with it? And the healthy partner you know, it's interesting. They really learn to become patient, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and asking questions, what can I do for you? And I think when that healthy partner is patient, it really forms a special bond mm -hmm. between the couple and they can really learn a lot of things from each other. So say they weren't great at communication before an illness. Now they really have to be great mm -hmm. at, at communication. You know, it's funny. I have a lot of poly people in therapy and one of the great things about them is that they have to have great communication <laughs> <It doesn't work. laughs> yeah. all the time, all the time. And, you know, so when I get two people that are in monogamy, you know, it's really working on their communication and how they can react to each other in a healthier way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, uh, my, my partner has chronic pain. So he's always his neck and shoulders is just kind of always hurting, but you wouldn't really, you wouldn't know because he doesn't talk about it often for various reasons. Um, and we recently had this discussion where um, he, he felt that he really desired um, more support from me in this in in me not just asking like oh how's your neck or anything but like me really coming about it like do you also wanting to research different things that would help him and just so that he didn't feel so alone and there's a part of me I'm I'm also the self sufficient so I have my you know I have daddy issues the self sufficient I got this I'm I'm you know I have a fight being too independent so does April over here <laughs> and. <laughs> so part of me is like oh okay wait okay you're asking for this thing when is 
is how do I step outside of myself? But I, I get it. Like I get that when, because we are in a partnership where we're really building together that um, asking or desiring a partner to really make this, this an, uh, an us or a we issue as opposed to just my isolated issue would be really, really important. It's very important and it creates more support with each other. And then that partner that does have an illness, they don't feel like they're isolating so much and it can actually help with their depression. Yeah. Yeah. They're not so alone. You're not so alone. And so when you have that support, it's critical. But then when I deal with, or when I work with people that have chronic illness that are single, it's a whole other animal sometimes. Well, and actually on that, because you commented, I wanted to share. So we posted something on our Instagram um, that was from, is it Sonia, Sonia Renee Taylor? She wrote the book, the, Your Body, The Body is Not an Apology. And she says that uh, the body is not an apology began as a conversation between two friends. Natasha feared that she had an unintended pregnancy. And when Sonia asked why Natasha chose to have unprotected sex with a casual partner, Natasha shared that her cerebral palsy made it difficult to be sexual and thus she did not feel entitled to ask her sexual partner to use a condom. Sonia's response was swift. Your body is not an apology. You do not use it to say sorry for my disability. And then it talks about how she created this book, but I think it really highlighted, we talk about single folks and they're going through this, especially if they just, they've always had the disability, they just discover they have this, this disability or a chronic illness or, or something. And it becomes a scary thing of, of uh, what if people don't want me, you know? Right. And then they believe their body's broken. So then yeah. they're not going to like have anyone. So one of the things that I do in therapy, I do a lot of cognitive work, a lot of cognitive restructuring on how they can reconstruct, you know, their thought process around that. And it's tried to get to a place where they can accept the things that they do have. And what are the strengths that are going on for them? Because that's going to carry them through this, right? And then hopefully they can meet someone. You know, I've had patients before where they've come in and they've had a chronic illness. And yes, it's invisible. But when you have lupus, you can end up getting um, your hands can turn purple depending on some of the symptoms of it. And I've known people that have gone out on dates and when they put their hands out on the table and they tell the person what they have, um, there's a situation where the person got up from the table and left. Mm. So it's, it's devastating um, when you don't have that support. And then again, it really does become ingrained that I'm going to isolate, I'm going to be depressed, I'm not going to have anyone. Mm. And so therapy is a great place to process that. Yeah, so you're not trying to do it all alone. And sometimes the medications that you have to go on also create more depression. I know that that's a lot of people, that's a side effect of many different medications. So it's all- sexual dysfunction. Yes, totally. I know my sister actually suffers from lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. She had like acute junior rheumatoid arthritis since she's been 13. Mm -hmm. She's now 46 and she's chronic pain has been a part of her her story. Um, And I- I'm actually really looking forward to sharing this book with her when um, it comes out. Um, Sex and love when you are sick is it's not yet out. And that's the thing. I mean, just thinking like I, you know, fortunately don't suffer from chronic illness or pain, but um, you know, I know someone close to me in my life that is, so I'm sure like the listeners out there, everyone can um, relate to this on some level, whether it's a direct correlation with your, your own relationship or yourself or a sibling or a friend, or um, I think this is so important. And thank you for this work that you're doing. Um, if people want to work with you, can they? Because you're obviously uh, in, in, the, in the realm of, of working with folks in DC. Um, if someone's not in DC, can they still work with you? Can you share with our sure. listeners? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the best way to contact me is through my website, which is www.drleephillips.com. And I have a place on there where you can contact me and ask me any questions. You know, we're seeing a lot of work now in tele, tele mental health where we're, people are doing Skype and Zoom for sessions because they're not in the area where you're at. And there's a lot of people out there in rural areas that don't have, you know, the resources like in LA, New York, or DC or any of the, of the other big cities. So it's nice to be able to do this through technology. Yeah, it makes you yeah easy to access. I think that's what a lot of people are that I've talked to as well. They're like in the middle of nowhere and they're like, how do I find, no one even talks about sex or anything. How do I find a sex therapist, yeah. let alone someone specializing in chronic illness, which I don't think there's probably a lot of them. It's hard to find sex therapists alone 
and then specializing in this. Right. Well. So there's not a lot of sex therapists that specialize in chronic illness. So I know I'm one of the few in DC and I'm pretty well known in DC, which is great. I stay very busy. I work like three 12 hour days and then one eight hour day. And all of my clients are either sex therapy or chronic pain and illness. Wow. Yes. Yeah, so there's yeah. definitely a need. Well, and the, the one, one last point that I wanted to, to kind of loop back to is we had talked about, um, you know, erectile dysfunction and there's a, oftentimes it's called erectile dysfunction when it's really isn't erectile dysfunction. It's, it's not, it's not necessarily dysfunction. The body oftentimes this can be really very much related to um, shame or the relationship and other factors. And um, we, when we were, what happens often if, if the penis is not working the way we want it to work, and especially if it's um, a regular thing. Um, and I, oftentimes it can become this big thing between partners where there's shaming, there's pressure, there's expectations. So I'm wondering if that in itself, because it, I think, again, there's like the, this is your problem and not mine or ours. And if in relationship, because that is a common thing for folks to deal with, if you're in a partnership with someone and they're having erectile issues, to not just make it their I wonder what you think about this. Is this like something that, and that's actually what we talk about. We make it something that we work together on. You know, you can, you can play with a soft cock. It doesn't always have to be hard. There's other, like you're talking about sensate focus and other ways to play. Um, but would you say that would be the same thing as, is really as. The tongue, uh, the tongue is fabulous. <laughs> yeah. 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 You have a whole mouth, everyone. You have a whole mouth, everyone. No, no, you're absolutely right. When it's a partnership and two people are really close and they've been together for a while or they've just started dating and you know, you share that news with your partner. Yes. It's, it's something that we're doing together. And I think when that happens, there's so much support. And I think we also need to look at the, you know, what happens in the normal thing with sex. Sometimes during sex, you lose your erection. It waxes and it wanes, right? So I talk a lot of my to my patients about that. Like if you go soft, maybe there's something else you can do. And then once you get hard again, you can finish, mm -hmm. right? So we talk a lot about that. So there's not so much shame. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that I think is really important for therapists to do is normalize mm -hmm. yeah. and say, hey, you know what you're going through, it's quite normal. You know, it's this does happen. And we find that with any type of like sexual dysfunction, a lot of times it's psychological. You know, you want to rule out all physiological type of things, medical things, you know, check testosterone levels. But we see it's a lot of, a lot of it is psychological. I'll have a lot of patients and they're like, yeah, man, when I look at porn, I have no erectile dysfunction. I get totally hard and I can masturbate and it's fabulous. But then when I go to have sex with my partner, I lose it. Yeah. And there's something this, to look at. Yeah. 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 So there's the sense of anxiety. And so we work on that relaxing, getting more out of one head and into the other head, you know? Yeah. And <laughs> so I would imagine again, like if that partner were to, to really show up in that way that was supportive and non shaming and like, you know, this is for us to work on, not just like you go figure it out and come to me when you're rock hard. Oh, like, oh, and, I've had, and I've had clients that have done that. They come in and they're like, my partner sent me to you or they wanted me to come to you because I need to work on my erection. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they get shamed. And I've even had clients where their partner breaks up with them mm -hmm. because of it. It's awful. And, you know, it's just, it's embarrassing. It's, it, they feel like they're broken. And I try to give them a lot of education in the beginning and really form a relationship with them. And then they can say, okay, this is a part of what's going on with me, but it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be the last of what's going to happen. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can still be sexual. Have you ever recommended a uh, hot octopus uh, pulse products, the pulse solo or duo for folks that have any sort of penis things happening or the non-responsive penis? Because it is, uh, it's like based on medical research in Denmark. Have you heard of it? I have not, but I'm going to. It, I, I'll send you one because it honestly, it changes people's lives. There's two different versions. I won't go into it too much because we've talked about it on the show many times before, but um, it's my, the actual company that I work with and they're in London. And they, I mean, it was part of the reason I went on board because of how many testimonials of folks saying that this product changed my life. And we work a lot with um, um, folks that like sex and disability. We do a lot of work um, with transgendered folks. So um, erectile dysfunction is also part of our mission to help that. So nothing's a fix or a, a, a total guarantee, right. but it is a really great product. So I'll make sure afterward, I'll get your info and I'll send you, I'll send that you a, a product so you can. I would love that. That would Absolutely. be. Absolutely. 
and this book is for like all different types of audiences. It's for, you know, you know, heterosexual. And again, April, I don't like the word homosexual either. Oh, okay. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I feel always queer, weird. Queer, that. Yeah, queer. Queer, yeah. queer. So for queer people, poly people, there's going to be different case studies in the book with like a poly couple. And so it's going to be for everyone. Oh, um, awesome. Not this heteronormative type of, you know, it's going to be a book for everyone, which I think will be great. Well, Dr. Lee, you are such uh, just an inspiration, such a beautiful human. And you got to check out your Instagram. P- yeah, like people out there have to check. What is your, what's your Instagram tag? Dr. Lee Phillips. It's okay. Very, yep. uh, so you do a lot of cute selfies. <laughs> yeah, I do selfies and I do a lot of micro blogging. I'm always oh, yeah. talking about, I'm always talking about sex. There you go. So follow yeah. Dr. Lee. Total sex geek. Yeah, we love sex geeks. Um, check out the book Sex and Love When You Are Sick. We'll be sure to make sure we make that know when it's uh, released. It's not yet out, but it will be soon. So uh, thanks so much. And Amy and I will see you next Tuesday, y'all. Ciao for now. Don't forget to head on over to our website at shamelesssex.com for more. And for 15% off of some of our favorite sex toys, use coupon code SHAMELESSPP in all caps at purepleasureshop.com.